morning and welcome to the Wednesday, April 18th, 2018 Board of County Commissioners meeting. I'm Kate Flavin, Public Information Officer with Sedgwick County. Over the past two weekends, April 5th through the 7th and April 12th through the 14th, Sedgwick County hosted an e-waste electronic recycling event. And I am pleased to report that we had nearly 4,000 cars come through the West Yard over those two weekends and dispose of 522,000 pounds of material um, in our community. So it's very exciting news for us. And right now I'd like to take this time to bring up Krista from the Division on Aging to talk a little bit about some of our programs. Good morning, Commissioners. Krista Levette, Division on Aging. The Wichita Sedgwick County Hoarding Coalition, in collaboration with the Central Plains Area Agency on Aging, and a variety, wide variety of city, state, and community organizations will host the Hands-On Approach to Hoarding 2018 Conference on April the 20th. This year's keynote presenter is Dr. Christiana Bradiotis, who is currently an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Bradiotis has completed extensive research on hoarding and multidisciplinary community interventions. Our coalition was one of five around the country that was selected to participate in one of the studies led by Dr. Bradiotis and her colleagues at the Boston University in 2008. The formation of the coalition began April of 2006 and was a collaborative effort amongst Cedric County, the City of Wichita, Wichita um, <coughs> excuse me, Department of Children and Family, and the Mental Health Association, as well as Prairie View and other community partners to combat the issue of hoarding and to develop collaborative efforts to deal with it in our community. Hoarding is not extensive collections. It is when an individual cannot use rooms and or furniture for its intended purpose or housing more animals than he or she can adequately care for. Hoarding starts as young as age five and it occurs in all social and economic groups. Hoarding is a problem for the community because of health hazards, poor quality of life, reduction of um, property values, and uses an extensive amount of resources. This long-term coalition is consistently working on ways to assist individuals in our community who excessively collect. We have a support group called the Clutter Cleaners Club that meets every third Wednesday at 2.30 for individuals that are interested in finding ways to overcome this issue. If you need a referral to the coalition, please visit our website at www.sedgwickcounty.org forward slash hoarding dash coalition or phone us at 316-660-5144. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions, but we do appreciate the information today, and thank you very much for thank what you, you do for our citizens. All right. Thank you. All right, and a brief rundown of the agenda today. There are two board appointments. We'll be celebrating our project ser search interns. We have an economic development item related to Spirit Aero Systems. There are three grants for corrections and items to consider on bid board. So with that, Chairman, I will let you kick off the meeting. Thank you, Kate. I appreciate it very much. And uh, with that, I'd like to call the meeting to order for April 18th, uh, 2018. I would do want to welcome the folks that are here from Project Search. Uh, we're going to recognize you here in a little bit. I want to also welcome all the other folks that we have in the audience today. We have a full house here. I'm sure that we have a number of people that are watching us on uh, Channel 8 and uh, that can also watch us on the Internet. So I want to welcome each and every one of uh, <coughs> the folks to our meeting today. With that, Madam Clerk, first item. Invocation to be led by Dr. Keith Peter, Cheney Baptist Church. Please remain standing for the flag salute. I'd like to read a recommendation before I pray, if you don't mind, uh, for those of you that may not know the history behind prayers at public forums. I'm quoting Benjamin Franklin at the Constitutional Convention. Um, he says, a small progress we've made after four or five weeks of attendance and continual reasonings with each other over our different sentiments leads to a melancholy proof of the imperfection of human understanding. In this situation, groping as it were in dark to find political truth, 
scarcely able to distinguish it when presented to us. How has it happened that we have not hitherto come to the thought of humbly imploring and applying to the Father of lights for, to illuminate our understanding? He then talks about the many evidences of God's intervention in the Revolutionary War. He says, those of us who are engaged in this struggle have observed frequent instances of his providence in our favor. Have we now forgotten that powerful friend? I have lived a long time, and he's addressing uh, George Washington, who was the president of the Constitutional Convention. I have lived for a long time, and have and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of the truth that God governs in the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire cannot raise with his aid? We have been assured in the Holy Scriptures the truths that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I believe this, and I believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of the Tower of Babel. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business and that one or more of the clergy of the city be requested to officiate in this service. So such prayers have been a tradition since the founding of our country and I'm honored to be a part of it. Can we pray together? <coughs> Father, much has changed since Benjamin Franklin acknowledged that truth a couple of hundred years ago. And what has not changed is human hearts and perspectives, reasonings, deliberations, foresight, and wisdom. <clears throat> Lord, I'm not aware of all of the events that are going to be before this committee this morning, but you are. I'm not aware of the hearts and the motives behind every petition and every suggestion, but you are. I'm incapable, as are all of us, of recognizing where the dis different choices that we might make will take us as individuals and as a community, but you are. So your word says that if we will acknowledge you in all of our ways, you'll direct our steps. So we pause to acknowledge your presence, your power, your perspective, and we ask that you would guide with grace, with kindness, with compassion, and with wisdom these decisions today, for we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Dr. Peter, thank you very much for being here today. We appreciate your attendance. Next item, please. Roll call. Commissioner O'Donnell? Present. Commissioner Anza? Present. Commissioner Howe? Present. Commissioner Unruh? Present. Chairman Dennis? Present. Next item, please. Public agenda. Thank you. We have uh, one speaker signed up today, Mr. Alan Drury. Uh, please approach the podium, and you have three minutes, please. <coughs> Okay, I want to, I appreciated the words of wisdom, hearing the words of Benjamin Franklin and his perspective on why we pray before meetings is very enlightening. Uh, religion was very important to the founding fathers and uh, there's also a lot of other rowdy things that the folks that were involved in forming this country were fond of doing as well. Um, I came here from Colorado. My grandparents lived here my entire life. Uh, I want to emphasize that I've always been very politically active. My brother was a county commissioner and a city councilman in Loveland, Colorado. And I was heavily involved with the process of getting cannabis and marijuana and such, as I spoke to before. I also have had people very important to me pass away from cancer recently. And I had a uh, client that I took care of it back in Colorado commit suicide when she was, when I informed her that I was going to have to leave Colorado and wasn't going to be able to care for her anymore and um, come here because of just things that took place around 
my activism back in Colorado and it's very difficult because I regularly have disturbing dreams because there's two ladies that I was involved with back in Colorado that committed suicide and I regularly have dreams of I don't know which one of them is coming and beseeching to me in my dreams but it's it tends to be kind of heavy and, and disturbing just to put it lightly my mother has COPD and congestive heart failure and it, it gets difficult sometimes and <coughs> I just really want to emphasize to you that this situation with Andrew Finch and officer Rapp I approached Lisa yesterday and wanted to speak to her and because I was wearing my boss uniform she didn't she didn't trust me she didn't want to talk to me I was wearing my suit like what I had on the last time I spoke to you and she felt that her response was who are you and why do you want to talk to me and then as I was leaving I stepped into the men's room and it was full of law enforcement officers and I have to say it was a little frosty because I got up and left with everybody that was speaking negatively and I would have no negative feelings towards law enforcement. I respect Chief Ramsey in a major way. I think that he's a wonderful man. And I feel that we are very, very blessed to have him as our police chief. I was at the Sunflower Community Action Center when he was giving his, uh, he was being given a welcome and he was speaking to the group. And that was the night of the XL mass shooting. And he was, you know, casually meeting with everybody and people kept on coming in and talking to him. And he got up and left at one point and he came back in and he remind, remained very calm. I'll wrap it up real quick here. And after the meeting, as we were leaving, I asked him what was going on and he told me of the mass shooting. And as we were walking in the parking lot, he approached the car that I drive, my mother's car, and I had a bunch of bumper stickers on it. You know, Barack Obama and various other Democratic activism bumper stickers. And Chief Ramsey says, oh my God, there's a Democrat in Kansas. And I laughed. And I said, well, there's, there are more of us out here, but I realize the atmosphere and I, but I really do want to emphasize that I appreciate my chance to be able to speak to you and I'll wrap it up. Thank you and God bless you all. I appreciate your service. Thank you for being here today. I don't have anyone else that has signed up to speak uh, on today's uh, off uh, our public agenda. If anyone else is in the audience though, we give you the opportunity. If you'd like to speak now, please uh, approach the podium. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, next item. Appointments. Item A. Accept the resignation of David Kennedy from the Salem Township Board Clerk position. Mr. Chairman, Eric Yost, County Councilor, uh, items A and B can be taken together. Item A is uh, the uh, resignation of David Kennedy as Salem Township Clerk. Um, this item uh, should be considered in conjunction with item B because item B is a resolution appointing Ms. Joni Hobbs to fill that uh, unexpired <coughs> term. Uh, to, to serve as Salem Township Clerk. Uh, Commissioner Michael O'Donnell is recommending that Ms. Hobbs be appointed and her term would expire on January 14th of 2019. Um, I am told that she uh, may be in attendance here today to take the oath uh, and I would urge adoption of both of these uh, items. Thank you, Mr. Yost. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm ready to make a motion if uh, I may. Do. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to thank Mr. Kennedy for uh, his service the last couple of years and also uh, to Ms. Hobbs for uh, taking on this important role in the township. And Clem Dickerson is our uh, township trustee, and so he and I have been in uh, communication over the last couple of weeks about getting this filled. So with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I move that we accept the resignation of David Kennedy, and I also move that we uh, appoint Ms. Joni Hobbs to the Salem Township uh, as clerk. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Do we have discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranzo? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. Okay, Ms. Hobbs. Hobbs Joni Hobbs. Yeah. Raise your right hand. 
I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Kansas and faithfully discharge the duties of the office of Salem Township Clerk. So help me God. I get it. Very good. You want to make any comments? No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, next item. Item C, resolution appointing Lamont Anderson to the Sedgwick County 3rd District Citizens Advisory Board. Mr. Chairman, uh, Eric Hills County Councilor again. Uh, item C is resolution appointing Mr. Lamont Anderson to the 3rd District Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, that this position had been held by Mr. Carl Coster, who passed away recently. Um, Chairman Dennis is recommending uh, that Mr. Anderson be appointed to this position. His term would expire on March 21 of 2021, and I would urge adoption of this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Yost. Uh, again, uh, Carl Coster was a, a vital member of our community and uh, also of uh, my <coughs> Citizens Advisory Board, and uh, his loss is, is a great loss to all of us. But we do have uh, Mr. Lamont Anderson, who is uh, stepping up to fill the vacant position that I have on my Citizens Advisory Boards. So I'd like to make a motion that we appoint uh, Lamont Anderson to the uh, Sedgwick County 3rd District Citizens Advisory Board. Second. And we have a second. Discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Andrew? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. And I do not believe that Mr. Anderson is here today. Next item, please. New business, item D, project search <coughs> graduation recognition. Good morning, commissioners. Jeanette Livingston, the assistant director of the Sedgwick County Developmental Disability Organization. I'm glad to be here to recognize the 2018 graduating class of our project search interns. As you know, Project Search is a collaborative project with Wichita Public Schools. It provides select students with intellectual and developmental disabilities real-world work experience. Uh, these students passed on a lot of the fun stuff they could have been doing in school to invest in their future and hopefully promote employment and get kind of a leg up on their competition as far as jobs. Uh, Project Search students work about 20 hours a week. Um, they do it in uh, three 10 week rotations that allows them to explore their kind of vocational interests and refine some skills. We greatly appreciate the Cedric County divisions that participate and host interns. This year we had a total of 10 divisions that participated that included Exploration Place, Print Shop and Mail Room, the Courthouse Cafe, Aging, Zoo, the CDDO, Comcare Medical Records, Cedric County Records Management, finance and human resources. And before I move on to the students, I did want to thank the staff. We had a teacher, Cheryl Hutcherson, and a job coach this year, and they were both brand new, and so they really had to hit the ground running, and they've done an excellent job, and I want to thank you both. So without further ado, I want to introduce the graduating students. We have James Benjamin. <coughs> And James interned at the Courthouse Cafe, Division on Aging, Sedgwick County Zoo, and with Human Resources. Through these internships, James has learned to speak up about what he likes and what he doesn't and to really advocate for himself. James is a hard worker and is searching for a part-time job where he can be active. James has excellent computer skills and attention to detail. Congratulations, James. Yes. Olivia Berlin. Olivia. Olivia interned with the Division on Aging, the Sedgwick County Records Management, and Finance. <laughs> Olivia has learned to answer incoming phone calls, process mail, alphabetize mail, and complete her tasks with accuracy. She's learned to have confidence in herself and her decision. She's been searching for an office or a customer service job where she can use her friendly can-do attitude. And she's actually been successful. I found out yesterday that she starts Monday as an office assistant at Center Industries. That's Olivia. Thank you. Jordan Kraft. Jordan interned at Exploration Place and Custodial Services and the Print Shop Mailroom. He's learned to use all of the print shop equipment, his favorite being the mail meter machine. <laughs> he enjoys delivering mail to the county departments, and he has learned that he has a talent for focusing on his work. He's overcome a lot of his shyness and has been better about learning how to ask for help. 
He has a great sense of humor, is trustworthy, and very responsible. Jordan is looking for part-time employment with an organization where he can be a team member and help people. Yay, Jordan. Lauren Cruz. Lauren interned at Exploration Place in the Explore Store, ComCare Medical Records, and the Print Shop Mailroom. Lauren has learned to focus on her work and was able to achieve 100% accuracy at ComCare Medical Records. She's learning to use a variety of office and print shop machines, and Lauren says that she's lear really learned how to be more independent this year. Lauren would like to gain part-time employment in an office or a customer service position. Do you want to say anything? Yeah. <laughs> I would like to thank all of you for being here to the commissionary meeting and thank you for all of the support, including Mitch. And Stephanie too. <laughs> Yohana Johanna, how did I get that wrong? Johanna Tiki. <laughs> Johanna interned at the print shop mailroom, CDDO, and is now at the Via Christi nursing station on the cardiac care floor. She has learned confidence this year and knows that she can do anything she tries. Johanna is very good at following procedures, likes to feel accomplished, and has a talent for teaching others. Johanna would like to find a part-time job where she can be around people and use her organizational skills. It's Johanna, thank you. I would like to thank you for coming and thank you for supporting us. So before I finish here, I just wanted to reiterate how important the Cedric County Division's participation is and that this is really a win-win opportunity. It's not just that the students gain excellent skills and abilities, but the departments are really the big winners as well. And to speak a little bit about that, we have the Cedric County Treasurer, Linda Kazire, and her employee, employee Ashley Thompson. Yes. <laughs> Ashley Thompson. I've been here almost three years at my job and I am always responsible, punctual, and dependable. And I learn new tasks from my supervisor if she is not available or not busy. And I was learning how to be accurate on my work and I was being reliable on everything and you are a good person to work with and I have a lot of <coughs> punctuality and I am very respectful and kind to others and I and co-workers need to ask my boss before I get help from them of their task <laughs> if it's available from my supervisor and I help each other with recycling if it's full <coughs> and I was being a good hard worker and I have a excellent supervisor and I am so grateful to one another and I do new stuff is and um, new stuff at work unless my boss shows me how to do it before I do it independently on my own and thank you so much all and I'm Ashley Thompson you are Richard Dave David Michael and Jim and have a good day today. Thank you.
Thank you. Commissioner O'Donnell has a couple questions. Commissioner O'Donnell. Well, I did have a couple of questions, Ashley, well, but you answered ready. most of them. But but I just want to know, I just want to know, um, do you like Linda? <laughs> <laughs> yes. A good county treasurer. <laughs> that, that's a great endorsement. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to say thank you to all of you for continuing your support of Project Surge. Once again, I'm putting the challenge out for other county departments to not only have the interns, but actually get some people hired. We've got to get these young people employed, gainfully employed with Sedgwick County. We need to go to the city of Wichita, start working with them. I know a lot of private businesses need to get involved. So we need some help, guys. So let's put that on our list. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Howell has a comment. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. I, I, um, I'm very impressed with James, Olivia, Jordan, uh, Lauren, and Johanna, and Ashley. And I just want to say, if they continue doing what they're doing now, uh, they can be used at a lot of great opportunities across this entire city. So uh, I love what they're doing. I just want to pick up those words that Ashley used. She used the words on time, faithful, accurate, reliable, dependable, responsible. If we can get employees like that in other places around town, <laughs> we need more. We need more. And Linda, I want to say thank you for, for hiring them, uh, hiring Ashley. She's a tremendous individual demonstrating a great skill set in our community and, and for the county. So I appreciate her dedication for three years, and I look forward to many more years in, uh, of her service to the county. But I'm impressed with all of the, all of the presentations this morning. I want to say thank you to Director Jeanette uh, Livingston for, for being part of this program and making this happen. It's important, and I'm impressed. And I, I just want to say thank you for uh, giving us good news this morning. We always like good news. And this has made my day. So I th appreciate all you've done to make this uh, a good event today. Oh, by the way, I see in my backup material that there's some kind of cookies or something coming that's up here. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we I do want to point have that out. Thank a you. reception immediately following. It's in the county boardroom. Um, hopefully, you guys will be able to finish up s shortly and come get a cookie and enjoy it and just tell the Project Search students the best wishes. Well, yes. thank you. And again, on behalf of the entire Sedgwick County Commission, we do appreciate what you do. Uh, we appreciate uh, the students being here today for the graduation. Uh, we hope that uh, we can get Commissioner Ranzo to be quiet for part of the meeting today so that we can get out of here early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that we can join you. Uh, one other thing that I should have mentioned, we do have uh, one of our electeds in the audience, and she's already spoken, but she had a birthday the other day, and it was the anniversary of her 40th birthday, Ooh. and we want to say, <laughs> say, say happy birthday to our treasurer. Again, thank you all very much for being here today. We sincerely, uh, it brightens our day. It's a great way of starting our meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Motion to receive Second. We have a motion and a second to receive and file. Discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranzo? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. Next item, please. Item E, presentation of retirement certificate to Donna Han Zip Tai. Eileen, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. I'm Eileen McNichol, your Chief HR Officer, and we have the opportunity this morning to honor and thank one of our Register of Deeds employees who has served our community with dedication, commitment, and pride. It's my honor this morning to present to you Donna Hazipta, who has reached a major milestone in her employment, her retirement after 23 years of service. Donna was hired on July 3rd, 1995 as a fiscal associate in the Register of Deeds office, becoming a Register of Deeds deputy on June 23rd, 2013. Her last day of service with us will be Friday, April 27th, 2018. Donna, Donna not only served the citizens of our community, but also helped the Register of Deeds office organize many United Way activities over the years. She was also passionate about softball. She started playing at the age of nine and played until she was 41. Donna is a descendant of 
Comanche Chief Tin Bears. She is half Kiowa and half Comanche. She has three children, Beth, Rob, and TJ. She also has 10 grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, one great-granddog, and <laughs> one great-grandbird. <laughs> with all of this, Donna is going to be keeping very busy, along with volunteering with United Way and fishing. Congratulations and thank you, Donna, for 23 years of dedication to Sedgwick County. Thank you. Would you like to I just want to say that the time that I had here at Sedgwick County has been so wonderful. I enjoyed my job so much over the years and um, all the people that I got to know were so helpful and um, it was just like a big family and I'm going to miss everyone tremendously. Thank you. Donna, thank you very much for being here with us today and good luck on your retirement. We're going to miss you. <clears throat> And while I was mentioning elected officials, I should have saw, just now noticed that uh, Tanya Buckingham is in the back of the room. Thank you very much for being here with us today. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you earlier. Madam Clerk, next item. Item F, authorize the execution of Project Eclipse Development Agreement with the City of Wichita, Spirit Aerosystems, and Eclipse Investment Association. Commissioners, uh, Mike Scholes, County Manager. Uh, I'd like to uh, present today for revisiting uh, Project Eclipse, and as the clerk said, to authorize the execution of Project Eclipse Development Agreement. Uh, the key thing about this are the partners that are here today, and I'd like to recognize them real quick uh, before I say just a few words. Uh, first, from Spirit, we do have Jim Coca. Uh, Debbie Gann and Sam Sackett, who were pivotal in putting this uh, uh, agreement together. Uh, very excited <coughs> for them to be here. Uh, getting to see them a lot. We may need to put them on the payroll. <laughs> so much, but, uh, also, from the Greater Wichita Partnership, uh, friends and partners, uh, Jeff Floor and Andrew Nave, who uh, honestly have, have put a lot of work into this and uh, worked a lot of nights, a lot of phone calls, and I appreciate all their hard work, continued hard work, not only on this, but everything they do. They do a great job. I just want to thank them personally for it. Uh, also, those not in the room that uh, really had, uh, you know, a lot to do with this uh, from the city side, Bob Layton and, of course, Scott Rigby. Scott, along with Tom, uh, probably be between the both of our organizations, did a lot of the the hard work and bringing Bob and I in for the decision points, but, uh, but certainly they did a lot of hard work, and I wanted to recognize them along with Brent Shelton, uh, Joe Norton, a lawyer. You got to have a good lawyer, and he certainly is for us on on this and many issues. There he is. Uh, so I wanted to thank them personally, but also uh, one that uh, haven't seen very often. Uh, but she certainly uh, has helped us out on this, uh, and that's Patty Bradley uh, from WSU, uh, research economist and instructor out at WSU, but uh, uh, her uh, email and phone has been worn out, uh, especially in the last couple of weeks that we gotten towards the end of this deal. So I want to thank you personally uh, for, for that and for showing up today. Uh, and the questions you may be asked, uh, I appreciate you, uh, you being here. Uh, last uh, Commissioners, last December, when you approved the Memorandum of Understanding uh, with the City of Wichita and Spirit Era Systems uh, related uh, to Project Eclipse, uh, I know you remember that, uh, but it was last November when we started working with uh, the three partners uh, in trying to bring you this project today. Uh, we met regularly. Uh, this is one of those projects uh, because of Spirit and what a great partner they are for this community. Uh, and how important they are for this uh, community. Uh, it was one thing that we knew uh, right from the beginning uh, that uh, we wanted to uh, work and collaborate with them uh, and be good partners, and we definitely uh, wanted to see them uh, uh, thrive and survive in this community because it just benefits us all. Um, for this uh, particular presentation, we're going to do it in three parts. Uh, first, Brent Shelton, will, he'll come up and discuss the item 
from the county's financial economic development perspective and then I'll ask Jeff Floor if he could come up and talk about the impact of this uh, particular public uh, private partnership uh, but uh, I think uh, we definitely would like to hear from Debbie Gann uh, who will come up and talk from the spirit aero system side and wrap up the presentation on what it uh, on what this project means from the company's perspective uh, three great speakers uh, for three great perspectives uh, to help you in this decision-making process. Uh, once the three speakers have addressed the board, we'll then open up the floor for questions. Thank you. Brent. Uh, all right, Brent. Thank you, Mr. Manager, uh, commissioners, and chairman. For the record, I'm Brent Shelton with the Division of Finance, and I'm here today to speak about Project Eclipse. As the manager said, what the item for your consideration is this morning is the approval of the Home Rule Resolution that would authorize the execution of a development agreement and the uh, supporting documents for the Project Eclipse Public-Private Partnership. Project Eclipse is a public-private <coughs> partnership between Spirit Aero Systems, Sudbury <coughs> County, and Wichita, Kansas. To give you a little bit of background, Spirit Aero Systems is a global leader in aerospace manufacturing that is headquartered here in our community. In 2005, when Spirit was formed as a spinoff from the Boeing Company, they had 7,000 employees in the local area. Since that time, they've experienced growth, and at the end of last year, had an employment footprint of 10,940 employees in the local economy. That makes them the largest employer in Sedgwick County. They're also the second highest taxpayer in the county, and last year county revenues alone from Spirit's taxes exceeded $3 million. As the manager mentioned, we were approached by Spirit last fall because of some demand that they had, they needed to hire more workers, they needed to make job and investment growth, and they were looking at a suitable place to locate that, uh, that economic activity. In addition to Sedgwick County, there were six other sites that were competing vigorously for this expansion. We were successful in bringing spirit here and maintaining their current employment levels. And as a result of that, we have the Project Eclipse Public-Private Partnership to share with you today. Let's just summarize a little bit what this economic development <coughs> agreement looks like. I'm going to start with talking about the public commitments that are being made, and then we'll go into the private sector commitments being made by Spirit. <coughs> the agreement, the development agreement will be, will create the Eclipse Investment Association. The Eclipse Investment Association is a venture that will be comprised of Spirit Aero Systems, Sedgwick County, and the city. Each of those will uh, form that investment association, and it'll be used to fund and then own some real property that will be the catalyst for this expansion at the Spirit Campus. The funding for the Eclipse Investment Association from the public side will come in terms of $7 million real property investment made by Sedgwick County a $3 million investment in that real estate made by the city of Wichita. And to get the city's commitment at par with the county, they have a purple pipe project that had a $3.5 million system enhancement fee associated to it, with it for Spirit, that they're waiving that. They've also committed to another $1 million in water quality improvements to the water that's being provided to the Spirit campus. In addition to that, the city will issue industrial revenue bonds that would carry a property tax abatement for five plus five years as a result of this partnership. The spirit uh, commitments would be, first of all, within the Eclipse Investment Association to fund the balance that's necessary to complete the first building that's in this big project. Currently, that building is estimated at about $23 million. So if you have the $7 million investment from the city, or from the county, the $3 million investment from the city, 
Spirit's going to be putting in $13 million into that facility as well. If the building comes in at $24 million, they're going to be putting in 14. So they're on the hook for the balance after that $10 million public investment. <coughs> One of the unique things about the commitments that are being made by Spirit is that they're committing to maintain and add employees with a commitment for 20 years. That's a big deal in the community to have that commitment of employment for that length of time. But remember that current employment figure at the end of last year at 10,940 employees, they've committed to maintain that level going forward for 20 years and also add a thousand new jobs at their facility and maintain that level over 20 years. Those thousand jobs come in the first two years in 2018 and 2019. They're not just jobs, these are good value added jobs with a base wage level of $56,000 per year. That in and of itself is an over a billion dollar commitment from Spirit to this local community in terms of employment and payroll. And I mentioned that these were value added jobs. That's one of the things that we look for in our economic development policy. A value added job is one that exports product and imports money. It doesn't just circulate existing dollars within the local economy, but because things are manufactured, purchased outside the area, that money flows in as those products flow out. Those types of job also create additional jobs to support them. We'll get into that in just a minute. The other commitment that Spirit is making is an additional $435 million net new capital investment in this region. In 2016, they agreed to a billion dollars uh, of expansion. This is in addition to that. <clears throat> and as a security measure, they're going to become the mortgagor on the building that's owned by Eclipse Investment Association. The mortgage will be in favor of Eclipse, and it's, it's an insurance policy in the event that some of the uh, conditions of the deal are not met. <coughs> So let's talk about that for a minute. What if everything doesn't, doesn't go as we wish? Well, as good stewards of public resources, one of the things that the economic development policy calls for are clawbacks, abilities to go into the deal if, things, if conditions are not met and the agreements are not met and bring back some of the investment that's been made. So they're in a couple of different forms on this economic development deal. First of all, in terms of the tax exemptions, there are five plus five year uh, property tax abatement. State law allows for a 10 year abatement, but the city of Wichita's policy now is to grant it for five years and take a look and see if the sufficient amount of investment occurred. If the other parts of that deal are being met, and if so, they can grant the exemption for an additional five years. It gives them that look halfway through the process. That is tied to two things. One, the amount of investment. Spirit will need to be funding these improvements with the industrial revenue bonds, adding additional buildings, bringing in new machinery and equipment. It's also tied to job performance. So there's a 15 year look back that's tied to job performance and if they haven't met or are not maintaining those net new 1,000 jobs or maintaining that employment level um, at almost 12,000 jobs. In terms of the building, I mentioned before that there will be a mortgage that Spirit will be the mortgagor on and basically what that does is secures a liquidated damage clause in the contract that says if Spirit ceases operating, they're going to pay you back the $10 million that was invested in that real estate. The county and the city would be made whole at that point. If the job numbers fall a little bit short, say they come in at 900 jobs on average over the 20 year period, pro rata share of that job creation, that would be a 90% success rate, but 
but they're going to owe back to the county 10 percent penalty on that 10 million dollars so there are a lot of protections <coughs> for the public dollars that are being invested in the project be they in terms of the investment in the real estate or whether that is uh, property tax forgiveness as with all of these economic development deals that require tax exemptions or some form of incentive we have an analysis performed by Wichita State University by the Center for Economic Development and Business Research and it tells us in fiscal and economic impact terms whether or not this is a good deal one that we should pursue so if we look at the costs and the benefits to the county we see that on the front end of this there's a seven million dollar investment made by the county in a 23 million dollar advanced technology warehouse on the spirit aero systems campus we're also going to forego some property taxes that would be there but for <coughs> the tax exemptions if this project would happen without those tax abatements but on the flip side we're getting some benefits as we mentioned before an, an additional 1,000 value-added jobs that are being filled today additional infrastructure by spirit aero systems of that 435 million dollars that's being invested by spirit through the industrial revenue bonds 96 million dollars of that is in real property that will be on the tax roll at the expiration of those tax exemptions I can't tell you exactly what that'll mean in dollar figures in 10 or 12 years, but if that was on the tax roll today, it would generate about $700,000 additional tax revenue to Sedgwick County alone, not counting the other tax authorities that would receive money from that. As mentioned before, there are potential spin-off jobs in the uh, community as a result of these being value-added jobs. And I think the biggest thing is it helps to ensure a long-term relationship with a very important business partner in our community, our largest employer and second largest taxpayer, Spirit Aero Systems. <coughs> but let's look a little deeper into the numbers that were provided to us as part of the economic development impact and the fiscal impact of doing this project. The thing that we focus on first is the county's benefit to cost ratio. Every government that's part of the project has a benefit cost ratio that's calculated. Our policy requires that we at least break even on this benefit to cost ratio. We have to have a one to one um, ratio in terms of the fiscal impact to ca the county government. In other words, if we forego a dollar in tax or invest a dollar, we need to see that dollar come back. That's our minimum threshold for moving forward with these deals. This one has a 1.08 to 1 benefit to cost ratio just in terms of that fiscal impact on Sedgwick County government. It did. Now in your packets, I need to speak about these numbers a little bit. You received in the packet an analysis that shows a 1.05 to 1 benefit to cost ratio to explain the difference between what I'm showing you here and what's in that packet it de it's determined by the manner in which the county's seven million dollar investment is treated the 1.05 to 1 ratio says that the county can uh, invest that seven million dollars on day one of the project but we have considered that we will probably finance that over a 10-year period so at the request of commission we looked at how does that impact the benefit to cost ratio by including those financing charges and considering the fact that we're actually paying it over time over a 10-year period when those two factors are considered it increased the benefit to cost ratio from 1.05 to 1.08 to 1. I think that's a testament to the fact that the county's in a strong enough financial position to take advantage of uh, low interest rates, low financing costs. One more thing about the benefit to cost ratio. <coughs> Our goal is a 1.3 to 
to one benefit to cost ratio. We really would like it to be there. If it's not, then we look at some other factors that pertain to the size of the deal, the overall <coughs> economic impact, and some other things. Because we could have a very small deal with a tiny bit of economic impact that might have a 1.5, a 2.0, a 3.0, 3.0 to 1 benefit to cost ratio. So let's look globally for a minute at the other parts of our economic development policy and see how these stack up. Policy says look at three more things. If we get two out of three, it's cause for consideration of the deal. The first one of these is the present value of net benefits. What that is, is putting dollars to the benefit to cost ratio. What we're looking for here is that the county would receive back at least a half a million dollars in net benefits. Cash, <coughs> 500,000 more dollars would come back to the county <coughs> than would go out in terms of our fiscal impact. This deal generates about $625,000 in net benefits to the county. It's a big enough deal that we're getting back that much more than we're putting out. The second thing we look at is how much real estate is going to go back on the tax roll at the conclusion of the project. We want it to be a big enough deal that there's a $50 million minimum investment that's required in policy. This deal, as I mentioned before, Spirit will be investing $96 million in real property improvements that will be on the tax roll at the conclusion of the tax abatement. As I mentioned before, that's about $700,000 additional tax a year just to Sedgwick County, not including the school district, not including the city, the state, and so forth. The third thing that we look at is jobs. How many jobs are being either maintained or created by this economic development activity? The policy states that we need to either be maintaining or creating 500 jobs. Well, we're maintaining the 10,940. We're also adding 1,000 new jobs at the Spirit Campus. So we double the minimum amount of required new jobs. We maintain a tremendous amount of jobs in the local economy. And the other thing about this is that we typically look at that job maintenance or that job creation over the life of the incentive or the tax abatement. Remember, that's a 10-year abatement. We've got this commitment from Spirit for 20 years. So we're also maintaining and creating those jobs, and that commitment occurs over twice as long a period as we would typically be looking at that. So in terms of our economic development policy, we meet, exceed any of the requirements that we need to say that this is a, an economic development activity in which we wish to participate in. A couple of other things to consider. One is that the 20-year commitment from Spirit to create those 1,000 additional value-added jobs will spin off, according to the analysis, another 1,272 indirect jobs throughout the economy. These are jobs that last for the duration of the 20-year period. A thousand new workers at Boeing, or I'm sorry, at Spirit, will support suppliers, home builders, additional retail, additional leisure spending within the community and that amounts to about $2.6 billion in payroll over the next 20 years. But they're going to be building some buildings. So we're going to have additional construction jobs. They won't last the entire time, <coughs> but we have temporary construction jobs. About 1,550 will be required to build and support the construction activity over the course of time as this, these projects are completed. That's another $71.5 million in payroll that will be added to the uh, local economy 
in spurts over this 20-year period. So basically, to sum up, Project Eclipse represents for you about a $2.7 billion <coughs> in economic impact, money coming into the local economy over the next 20 years. And that would conclude my part of the presentation. I think, Jeff, are you next? Let me welcome Jeff Fleur to the lectern, and he'll speak a little bit more about Project Eclipse. Good morning, Jeff, and welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir, and thank you for this opportunity to be able to uh, speak to you about a very dynamic project that is shaping our community not only today, but actually, as Brent has told you, will into the future as well. Uh, we do appreciate the opportunity to work with your team, uh, as the county manager has said. Uh, we work in concert with you on a number of projects. I know a couple of weeks ago we were talking about the numerous ways in which we do that. Uh, so again, Mr. Manager, thank you for the opportunity to work with you, you and your staff on this project. Uh, and we also want to express our support for this project this morning uh, from the Great Wichita Partnership. You know, we are very fortunate uh, to have the headquarters of Spirit Aero Systems here in Wichita. They are a global aviation company. Uh, I will tell you that as we work with other projects across the country and even globally, it's a highly competitive market for this company. Uh, they are a company that demonstrates success uh, in what they do. Uh, they stand behind what they say they will do. Therefore, other states want them. Other countries would like to have even a larger presence. So for the fact that we had this announcement here for Wichita, I think is very dynamic uh, in itself as well. Um, they are also really contributing to the transformation that's underway. We have talked about that in Wichita. There's a lot of things that are on the increase here currently, um, not only in Wichita, but the region. And certainly Spirit uh, Aerosystems is a big part of that. You know, the company also contributes, I think, greatly to the quality of place through their charitable giving. Uh, in 2017 alone, this exceeded $5 million by this corporation. Uh, they value employee engagement in the community. You will see this through a number of nonprofits throughout our city, but also the region. Uh, their support of WSU Tech is, is hugely important. Just this last week, we were there for, I think, a remarkable event talking about the creation of WSU Tech, uh, where it has come from, where it is today, and where it can lead us. It is a national, but also a global model for other countries and companies to see how we're training aviation expertise here, and it's here in Wichita. Uh, they spent about $350,000 last year alone with WSU Tech. They're projecting this year to be uh, upward of $400,000 of investment with WSU Tech with training that they need at their workforce. Uh, through Spirit's commitment to invest a billion dollars and also the creation of the thousand jobs that we're talking about this morning, uh, the commitment of the thousand jobs has uniquely placed our region, our state, in a top ten list of 2017 announcements. So a top ten list, there have been only nine other projects in the country that have the magnitude of this type of job creation last year in their announcements. So again, how is it they're helping us position Wichita in the region? tremendously as we work with economic development. If you look at the largest projects in the state, this is the largest one within the last five years within our state. Uh, within Wichita, it's the largest since our recession. So again, great rebirth of opportunity here in our city and also our state. Uh, as I've mentioned, they position us to be a distinctive city, but also a city of opportunity. Um, these thousand jobs are tremendous in that. Uh, they offer, offer opportunities for those looking for their first time job. It helps the underemployed in our community. Uh, it was uh, remarkable to see a video recently about the generational uh, legacies that you have at Spirit Aerosystems as far as families and, their, and them being present here in this community. So the retention of families is huge on their agenda as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, is really important to note, I believe this morning, is to kind of give you an update from the MRO show that we were at last week. Uh, we had staff there. Uh, that's actually a show that uh, MRO being the maintenance, repair, and operations event that you encourage us to start going to about three years ago. Seeing great success as far as prospects coming from that. One of the interesting things that uh, we did this year, there's been a lot of discussion around talent. Not only the retention, but the attraction of talent. These are moments of opportunity to bring new people into our community as well. So we purposely, in our booth design for MRO this last week, had talent boldly placed, if you will, on some of the displays. We noted the opportunities that are happening with Spirit, Textron, Bombardier, our suppliers. And what was dynamic is that our staff reported they literally had people bringing resumes to them so that we could bring those back 
to these various companies for opportunities. So already seeing attraction opportunities. Now, what we want to do is build upon that. So in seeing that type of response, one of the things that we'll be doing in the months ahead is that we will be attending NBAA uh, back in Orlando where this event was last week. So we are actually thinking about how is it, with some of the things that we do going forward, um, how is it that we have a job fair potentially uh, incorporated in some of these events? Because again, if you've only had 10 of these across the country, we're uniquely placed to be able to attract talent and help grow the economy in that way. So a lot of opportunities uh, coming through this announcement and, and also this proposal for you today. I think Brent has done a phenomenal job of outlaying, if you will, the economics of it. Uh, I think hopefully I've given you an idea of some of the things it's positioning us, not only in North America, but globally, the opportunities it will as well. Uh, at this time, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Debbie Gann, who is the Vice President of Corporate Communications and Am Administrations for Spirit Auto Systems, to make a few comments as well. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Dennis, uh, County Commission. Before I, I jump into this one, I want to take just a minute and thank you for your leadership and, and thank the county crews for getting the Hawk system installed on MacArthur right adjacent to the, uh, the Spirit plant. It, uh, it's been up and operating for a little over a week and I can tell you it is already making a tremendous difference in terms of keeping our employees safe as they cross uh, MacArthur to, to get to and from work every day and and so far we've seen absolutely no traffic tie-ups or any backups so it's it's been incredible and I just want to to thank you for that because it's it's very important to our employee populace thanks for those comments uh, Commissioner Howe pushed that through and uh, <laughs> David Spears public workers are the ones that made it happen so we thank them yeah David thank you Commissioner thank you I think that project is really just indicative of the great partnership and support we've received from the, the County Commission uh, over the years. Uh, as you know, Spirit was created in 2005, and uh, since then the company's invested more than $2 billion in our Wichita site. With this agreement, we'll be investing another billion over the next five years. As you all know, we're at historic production levels at our site, producing more airplanes than we ever imagined that we could, and we are hiring aggressively to fuel that expansion. Uh, I am happy to report that our uh, we're actually ahead of plan on hiring. Uh, we are fast approaching 12,000 employees at the Wichita site, and we have 350 openings today, so still looking for uh, talent to come in and fill these jobs. Last year, our payroll in Kansas was about $1.2 billion. We expect to exceed that this year. In addition, we spent about a billion dollars with suppliers in Kansas, about 550 uh, of them. So certainly uh, the reach goes beyond the walls of Spirit Aerosystems. And we are a global company and we do have sites uh, in several other places around the world. But Wichita is our headquarters, it's our base of operations, and we believe it is home to some of the most talented, hardworking uh, mechanics and employees anywhere in the world. So while we will grow in other parts of the world, this agreement really solidifies our long-term commitment uh, to this county, to this community, uh, and to the state. So we certainly appreciate your consideration and uh, and just thank you for partnering to help bring these jobs to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. At this time, uh, do we have any questions uh, from the commissioners on any of the issues? Uh, Commissioner Ranzow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for the record, I, I want to show that I've been quiet in this meeting <laughs> up to this point. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I have quite a few things I'd like to say and um, some information put out there. Um, first of all, I want to say I appreciate that Spirit's uh, decision to expand here. Okay, I've never opposed that, and I, and I appreciate that decision that they've made to do. I, I previously worked at Boeing as a computer analyst, the predecessor to, to Spirit, and I have a lot of friends that still work out at Spirit. Spirit, and so I think this is uh, this is a very good, um, very good for our community. That being said, I have to make a decision based upon this particular agreement here to, to basically spend $7 million, 7.9 with interest, to build a building for Spirit. 
And I, I have to answer the question, is this necessary and appropriate? That is, is it necessary for this expansion to happen, and is it appropriate function of government and, and, and in our best interest to spend this cash out of our reserves, or um, could all this happen without it? And so um, I do a lot of research, and I take this very seriously. I know there's things that come before us from time to time that we're just expected to rubber stamp, and if we don't, you know, people will criticize and say, oh, you don't like economic development, you don't like this, but that's not the case. I have to, I have to look at the facts and balance everything with the cost of the taxpayer and plus and minuses to the community. So um, I want to share some information uh, rather than just ask people to write. The, I, I've got a bunch of information that I've collected uh, to base my decision on. Um, uh, and so I'm just going to share this information. If anything ends up sharing is incorrect, then I think people can come up and correct me um, later on because I want to have correct information but I think it's important to for any any situation like this we have to see the big picture not just this particular agreement that's about seven million dollars in cash to build a building okay so I've, I've looked at a lot of things uh, to find out uh, some things that we're doing are, are doing now that are just related specifically to this project but there's also been some other things that have been done at the state and local level to give a favorable tax treatment to um, to Spirit and other companies uh, that are ongoing, and I think we need to get credit for that. Okay, so when I add up all the stuff that I know about so far, I think the the, the total tax subsidy of everything together uh, that we can relate to this is is about a hundred million dollars, and that doesn't include like HPIP or peak which they may get or job retraining money or other favorable issues that exist at the state level compared to other states that have been quantified, which brings me, um, and so I've added up to $100.2 million, and I'll get into the details here in a minute. So if we don't spend $7 million today, then the total subsidy will be $93.2 million, at least. It's going to be more than that. So my question is, is that enough? And I have to say yes, I think that should be enough for reasons that I'll explain later, later, but that we need this $7 million in cash to help provide for roads and bridges, police, fire, et cetera, okay? Uh, I, I, you know, it, I've asked, you know, I said I, I'm not sure that this deal wouldn't go forward without this $7 million. It doesn't make sense because you're getting $93 million worth of subsidies and there's some other things they'll talk about. And I've been told things, well, yeah, but they have responsibility to their shareholders, or we have to show them that we care, et cetera. Well, I understand they have responsibilities to the shareholders, but we have responsibility to our taxpayers. And there's a variety of ways that we have shown that we care at the state and local level. Um, unfortunately, I, it's been brought to my attention that when we negotiate with the partnership, all of these favorable tax things that exist aren't necessarily, they're not quantified and they're not listed to say, hey, we're already doing this. For example, and one of the examples is a machinery and equipment exemption, which was put in by the state in 2006. Um, for this particular deal, it, it adds up to $50.6 million. That's there. That's not included in this calculation up here on the return on, it's not even so this is not even presented during the negotiation to say we're already doing this, but it's a, but it's listed as an incentive, and it's a very powerful and it's a lot of money and it's and it's there. As a result of that, I've been told by staff that you know that's reduced our county revenues by ten percent. That means everybody in this community is paying an extra ten percent, or you're getting ten percent less services as a result of this one particular thing. And I think we should get credit for that, and that should be considered in all of this stuff. Okay. Additionally. Um, Spirit is not in the city of Wichita. It's an industrial district. This is the agreement between the city and the Wichita. If they were to be annexed by the city of Wichita, their taxes would go up by over nine mills. Okay, so that saves them five hundred, I think, thirty-two million, five hundred thirty-two thousand dollars a year over the twenty years of this evaluation. I mean, that's ten point six million dollars. I think we should get credit for doing that to help them out. Okay, and there's other things that are out there that haven't been quantified and there's things like I say at the state level that should still come to fruition later on the um, the ones we're talking about here is about 39 million dollars from the city county state and school district as far as tax 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 abatements and and cash stuff um, 
So that's that's a lot of money. And I, and I think we have demonstrated, and we continue to demonstrate them. I, I have some concerns. I, I think going forward, I think we need to do a better job uh, when the partnership meets with businesses at quantifying how much these are worth. Because I can assure you the businesses know what these these tax rules mean to them financially. And when we go in to talk to them, we need to present these numbers and say, we're aware, too, that we're already giving you $60 million or $70 million in favorable tax treatment. That's meant to help lure you there. We should get credit for it, okay? But we, we need to have some money to run our operations, okay? Um, so I have to ask myself, so if, I mean, is this necessary? Well, well, I, I want to look at, let's look at Spirit, great company. Can they afford to build this building on their own? Well, I would say yes. I, just some of the recent information that's came out in the Eagle is we know that um, in 2017, they had revenues of over $7 billion, net income of $355 million. That's great. They can afford to pay your, their CEO $7.5 million in cash and benefits. They gave bonuses recently to everybody that ranged at least from 9.6 to 12.8, and that's fine, that's good. But that's a lot of money, they haven't quantified that. They repurchased stock, spent $502 million to repurchase stock, they've authorized another 500 million, that's a billion dollars that they're gonna be able to spend to repurchase stock. They've got $423 million cash on hand. And then don't forget the federal tax changes that go into effect this year for all of us and businesses. That, that was big. That was pushed as economic development for everybody, not just spirit. It applies to lots of businesses. Okay, that that needs to be kept in mind too. So there's sure there's plenty of, I mean, they can afford to do this. So I, I just um, think that we as a, as a community have demonstrated that we appreciate and want them there. Now this particular deal that we're talking about here is we're going to build a building. We're going to create a LLC with the city of Wichita and create a building for them and then give it to them after 20 years. This is unprecedented. We've never done it before. I think it is a precedent that we should not set. Okay? We don't levy property tax money to build buildings for other companies. We're having our own discussions about having to build our own admin building. Okay? That's where that money, that's the building that that money should go to. Okay? Every year we have to say no to certain requests within county government on what we spend money on, okay? Calm care, corrections, the sheriff, EM, everything. As a result of this, for the next 10 years, we'll have $790,000 every single year less to spend in property taxes. That means we'll have to say no, $790,000 worth a year, every year for 10 years, okay? Um, I really think, I said this before and some other, saying this has been several years ago, this will actually hurt us more than what it's really going to help spirit. Okay, I really believe that. Uh, the city is putting money into it for, and for giving money for water and infrastructure, and yet we hear all the time how they're needing money for infrastructure. I mean, I've heard things that they had problem meeting payroll the last quarter of last year, and they're in significant financial problems. Aren't they talking about reducing fire services, um, that, that's, that's a problem. But I mean, so I think, I'm, I, I just think $93 million should be enough. <clears throat> I appreciate their efforts. I, I can't be supportive of this today because I don't think it's an appropriate use of taxpayer funds and I don't believe it's necessary to make this deal happen. Um, I'll also say I'm a little disappointed and fr frustrated with these return on investment sheets. You know, we originally approved, passed a resolution in December, December 13th. And we were get, we had a couple of them. I think the one that we, were, we made the final determination on, it said we're going to get a cost-benefit ratio of 4.19. Now we're down <laughs> to 1.08. But the problem is we had, we had two different versions, but... They just weren't correct. We made a vote then based upon wrong information. 
the salaries are wrong, the investments are wrong. One of them didn't even include the $7 million. And that's another thing. I've had arguments that the $7 million for spending shouldn't even be included in here because it's not cash, but it is the same as cash. But, and that's very disappointing that the partnership that's supposed to be working for us as well would make that argument, okay, to, 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 to kind of take it off. It, it doesn't make sense. Now, I do have... Um, one question here as far as the con the um, <coughs> this contract and we have clawback provisions maybe I'm not so sure who should <coughs> maybe Brent or somebody okay here, here's the issue that I have right now the version that we have so the clawbacks are based upon fifty six thousand dollars in annual salaries correct right and our return on investment calculations I mean, they put the average salary range for all 20 years, and it starts at 56,000, but it goes up to 81,000, and that's just, it's. I did the calculations. This is a two percent increase every year. Okay. Okay. So the return on benefit is based upon having salaries that go from 56,000 to 81,000. Is that that's correct? Is there anything in the contract that ensures that that, that that we start at fifty six thousand, but at the end of the twenty thousand or twenty years, it's it's increased to eighty one thousand, keeping with inflation or whatever, whatever costs. I mean, do we have a guarantee, or is it are they going to be at fifty six thousand twenty years from now? When you understand what I'm saying, the mm -hmm. the return on investment is based on that fifty six thousand going up to eighty one. But do we, do we have any guarantees or any clawback provisions that if they don't also increase up to eighty one, that that would trigger that, or is it just fifty six thousand the whole? I think it's a base of $56,000 in uh, base wage, not including the benefits, um, <clears throat> overtime, and, and any bonuses. Okay. Yep. So my argument is, and I've, I've said this before, is when we do, when we do a, a uh, return on investment and we have clawbacks, we have to have, I think we should have clawbacks that ensures we get that return on investment. Okay. If it says we're going to you know, have X amount of salaries and, and we're going to base it on a salary range for 56 to 81,000. We need to have clawbacks to ensure that's happening because we are approving this based upon these calculations that give us, you know, we're just barely over one. And I know this is an exact science, so it might be more, it might be less. I mean, it, it's not an exact science, so we might even be close to one anyway. But we're, we're proving this thinking that we're going to make whatever you set up there, six hundred some thousand dollars over 20 years or a million or whatever. But that's based upon those salaries increasing 2% a year every single year, and that's not in here. So that's problematic. I, even if we're inclined to to support and pass this, I would encourage us to table this and re redo the language to ensure that that happens. Because otherwise, we this we made a good attempt trying to get her clawbacks, but it doesn't guarantee it. It, it doesn't it doesn't guarantee us we're going to get what's in here. Okay, so. Um, that's kind of a, even if I were inclined to support this, I want this, this guarantee and this clawback to reflect what's said in here, and I don't believe that it does. So I would encourage us to uh, not proceed for that reason and, and, re and, and, and uh, renegotiate that and change that. But, uh, but in closing, I, I want to say that I'm not going to be supportive of this particular option. I think $93 million of taxpayer subsidies is, is enough. Uh, and not all of them are even included in this ROI. And we need this money to help provide core services and help. And I, I think um, I, I, I would really encourage uh, everybody to include Spirit to reconsider this and understand that this, you know, we have to be able to draw the line. When, when is enough enough? How, how many tax benefits, how many ongoing favorable things do we have to put into place? When is enough enough? And I think $93 million, I think, is where I could draw the line. And, and let's preserve this cash so we can do our core services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Howell. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, appreciate the presentation by those of you that spoke. And I just want to clarify and make sure I heard this correctly. I had a couple of things I wrote down, but I want to make sure I, I heard them correctly. Can you please share, I think it was Brent that uh, shared this. Can you please share once again, what was the uh, amount of money that the, the company has put into the community in terms of charitable giving? What was that number again? 
I think Mr. Fleur spoke to that about $5 million. $5 million last year. Was that, that was just last year? Right. Okay. That's, that's extraordinary. And then um, the money they invested in the, uh, into the uh, WSU Tech, that's another extraordinary number. That was a... Approximately 350 last year, yeah. 400 this year. Okay, good. Those are the numbers I wrote down. That's what I thought you said. So <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, with, respect, with respect to previous comments, you know, I just heard a bunch of information I, I hadn't heard before uh, just a few minutes ago. So I'd like to go through just a couple items there. I don't want to get into a back and forth. I, I know there's cookies waiting for us, and so I want to make this fast. You know, with, with respect to the decision in front of us this morning, we're not talking about $93 million. We're talking about seven. Um, m most of the decisions on the $93 million, if that's even a, a right number, I'm not saying that it is. Our decisions that others have made uh, it, previous times, part of that you mentioned just a minute ago was, was 50, over $50 million was, was mission and equipment exemption done by the state of Kansas back in 2006. So that's their decision. And uh, I think about my, my, when I file my income taxes, I take advantage of every deduction I possibly can to, to make my cost to, uh, to the, my, my, or my payment I make to the government as small as possible. I don't, exp I don't uh, blame anybody else for doing the same thing. Those are the rules set up by governments, and we should take advantage of every opportunity. And I think that uh, Spare Door Systems needs to take advantage of every opportunity. This is one that the state set up, and they should take advantage of it. Uh, I guarantee you that every, every state across this nation has things like that that uh, tries to lure companies and try to make them prosperous and profitable. And uh, if we did not provide that exemption, I guarantee you they, they would have a, a bigger reason to go elsewhere. So I'm glad that they're getting that type of consideration. And they do provide a tremendous amount of opportunity for our, to our community. And I think that these numbers actually are very modest. Uh, if you think about the, the existing 11,000 jobs and, and do some analysis on that in terms of the, um, in the, um, the indirect jobs that that creates over 20 years, um, by my calculations, and this may be way wrong, because I'm just doing simple math here, but it uh, looks like, to me like the, vet, the value to this community, because of spirit, is about $50 billion over 20 years. And so their, their numbers are very modest. They're just talking about the increase. But I'm thinking about the fact that Spirit provides tremendous opportunity for our community already. And so, you know, to the extent that uh, we just lost Boeing a few years ago, I was directly impacted by that decision. And for the record, I do have opportunities with Boeing, and I have had in the past, but it would have required me to move. I, I wanted to stay here. And uh, I love Wichita, mm -hmm. and, and so I'm doing this now. But uh, I've worked at Boeing for 11 years. And uh, one thing, a couple things I learned uh, while I was there is that, uh, you know, in terms of a fair playing field, look at the global field. Airbus, I assure you, gets tremendous incentives and tremendous subsidies from countries all over Europe because they, they benefit from Airbus selling lots of airplanes. Boeing does get incentives, but uh, not even comparable to what is happening to Airbus and to, to the extent that they are very competitive with each other. I think it just demonstrates that Boeing has done a, a very good job of trying to compete, but Spirit's a great part of that. And, um, you know, the fact that they're, they're expanding, they're choosing Wichita, I'm very pleased with that. They could go anywhere. They could go outside this country. One thing that's making this uh, interesting right now, and you know, someone mentioned tax laws changing, but let's talk about tariffs for just a moment. That's, that's going to be very hard, I think, on someone who uses a lot of aluminum uh, and potentially other materials as well. So. I, you know, I, th I think this is, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things changing here. The only decision we have in front of us right now is the $7 million. And if I understand the return on investment, Mr. Shelton, you, maybe you can clarify this once again, but that return on investment is tax dollars to Sidgwick County. It's positive. It's more than one-to-one. -one. Right. That's correct. So for every dollar we spend out of Sidgwick County, there's more than a dollar coming back. That's right. Okay, so I don't want to think of government as an investor, but let's think about that for a minute. If we spend tax dollars, it actually benefits the Sidgwick County to be involved in this deal. It actually is more dollars to Sedgwick County than we spend to, to initiate this. Mm -hmm. And along with that, a thousand jobs, a billion dollars in capital investment. Um, I'm, I, am in, I, I, I would say, let me say this, I think this is an extraordinary opportunity. And um, maybe I stand alone by saying it that way, but I think this is uh, great for us to, to consider this this morning. I'm glad they're choosing to invest in Wichita. I think this is great for our, our community and for our constituents to have more opportunities for job training and careers that they can retire from and have raise their families and, and uh, educational opportunities. The charitable giving that they give our community is it's outstanding. So and anyway, I understand from a free market perspective, people might not like the way this works, but uh, every other state's involved in it. 
it's a, it is seven hundred and ninety thousand dollars every year for ten years with clawbacks in place, and it benefits the county. For every dollar we spend, it benefits the county to a greater uh, greater degree than what we spend uh, make, to make this happen. And in terms of the four uh, check marks you've got: cost ratio, net benefits, capital investment, and jobs. We meet all four. I would suggest, you know, there are other communities. I would like to know if they have a return on investment calculation, because it doesn't make sense they can invest as much money as they do. The the return on investment to those other communities has to be a negative number. And if they if it ever turns positive, it's probably decades in the future. And so I I just think that uh, we need to go ahead and move forward. And I know cookies are waiting, so I'll go ahead. And, I'd be glad to make a motion. We would authorize the execution of the project eclipse. Development agreement with the City of Wichita Spirit Air Systems Incorporated and in Eclipse Investment Association. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. To further discussion? I'd like to make a couple. Well, Commissioner Unruh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I just want to um, recognize, the, uh, and they have been mentioned, all the folks that have been working very diligently the last uh, several weeks on trying to uh, analyze this from about every direction possible to make sure that we have accurate information and one that clearly represents our involvement in this uh, project. And so Spirit and Sedgwick County uh, staff and the City of Wichita and WSU, uh, the partnership who have been helping us through this, I, um, I just want to express appreciation for all your hard work in it. But mainly I want to uh, express uh, then I'm, I, I guess the right word is grateful that uh, Spirit would um, keep us in the game. Um, they have opportunities. They had, I think my understanding is, six other folks who were um, competing for this um, investment and expansion. And uh, I have no doubt, although I don't know the facts, what others offered, but I'm sure that other communities have um, resources where they could offer uh, a, a richer incentive than we did. So I'm just grateful that um, the folks at Spirit have made the decision that they want to expand here and continue to partner with us and help our commu community grow over the next 20 years. Um, the, the numbers that I focus on, I, I appreciate all the detail and I have looked at it and uh, tried to comprehend, comprehend most of it anyway. Um, but the numbers that I look at are 2,272 jobs in total that will uh, accrue to our community and uh, 2.7 billion dollars into the local economy and, and payroll and this is um, this is significant and I think it's uh, worthwhile for us to um, uh, consider it and in my opinion it's the uh, it's the right decision to support it so um, I'm pleased to say that um, I will have part in the decision to help our economy grow for the next 20 years so but thank you all who are involved Thank you. Commissioner Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a clarification. I read the wrong, wrong part of the sheet here for the motion. I just want to make a, a motion to clarify. My motion is to approve the agreement and authorize the necessar necessary signatures. Thank you for clarification. And second. And the second uh, also accepts that clarification. Uh, I'd like Commissioner Anza. Go ahead. Well, I, I accept that uh, this will likely uh, go forward. Um, but I do think that it's important that the, that the agreement and the clawbacks actually guarantee what is given to us in the RLI package. And at this point, it doesn't. So I'm going to make a substitute motion that we table this and instruct staff to continue uh, discussions to reach an agreement that protects, that actually uh, gives us protection for the uh, salary numbers that are provided for in the return on investment calculation sheet, which is the basis and the reasoning for why we're doing this. Thank you, Mr. Ranzo. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Motion fails due to lack of second. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I got to say I'm very disappointed. Um, let's make this very clear that this, this, this agreement does not provide for what we say we're going to get. And it's, regardless of what you think about this, we have, we have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayer to ensure that agreement guarantees that. We don't have that today, okay? Um, there's a lot, and I'm disappointed that we, we won't even want to do that. 
there, like I said earlier, there are things that come before us that as commissioners, we're supposed to just rubber stamp and not question us and not look at the data and just do what we're told. This is one of them. But I, I, that's not how I operate. And um, I mean, what? Why even? Why even do this? Why even have these return on investment? The first one, when we when we did the original agreement in December, wasn't even accurate. And why do the agreement if it's not going to guarantee what you say you're going to get in this? Why do it? It's it, it's 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 smoke and mirrors. And. Um, Like I say, I support decision, my spirit to, to stay here. But what we're doing here today will not change the outcome one way or the other. Thank you. Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, thank Spirit Aerosystems and everyone uh, here today, Debbie and Sam, and uh, um, all the work that you guys put into it. This is a, a phenomenal project. I'm thrilled to support it. Um, th this isn't just good for uh, the county, but this is good for our entire community in the uh, aviation sector. Um, I know we're talking about that, <clears throat> about the $7 million figure and about how that's coming out of our budget, but it, it, it is so much more than $7 million that we're going to be getting back to the community. Um, I know Commissioner Unruh just mentioned that there's a half a dozen other states that were actively competing for this, but I think we're all smart enough to know there's 50 uh, states that would love to have Spirit Aerosystems. Uh, located within their boundaries. So I'm just excited to support this. These uh, 11,000 uh, jobs over the next 20 years that are guaranteed, the, the thousand new jobs, these are going to be individuals and families in our community that own homes and pay property taxes, that own vehicles and pay property taxes, that are paying sales tax to our community. Just the, the, the benefits of this project are, are truly hard to calculate, but, but it's positive all around. And I mentioned this last time this got brought up, but, but in all my years in elected office, I've never had a project that I truly believe has the, the beneficial magnitude that this project does. So uh, um, I'm, I'm excited to see Spirit prosper. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, some final comments from me. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Spirit Aerosystems uh, for uh, working with us on this deal. I think it's important for our community. I want to thank uh, GWP for the work that they've done on this. Uh, the city of Wichita that uh, was involved. WSU who's helped us make the calculations up and down the line. The staff that we have here in Sedgwick County that uh, went above and beyond to, to try and keep us informed uh, every step of the way and to make sure that we knew exactly what we were doing. Spirit Aerosystems had an opportunity to go to six other locations and they chose Wichita. Chose Wichita uh, and Sedgwick County because it's a great location. We have great people. We have uh, people that know how to build airplanes here in Sedgwick County. And it's not just Sedgwick County. This deal is going to benefit Butler County, Sumner County, Cali County, because Spirit Aerosystem workers work in each and every one, uh, live in each and every one of those counties. So it's not just Sedgwick County that's going to see the benefit of this. One of the things that uh, we look at is our return on investment. Uh, Granted, this return on investment is just above our one-to-one uh, one ratio that uh, we require before that we make uh, uh, a deal on something. And <clears throat> I don't know that there's any commissioner that would say that we're going to go out and, and lose money on a deal. Uh, therefore, any time that it's positive uh, is a good deal, and we're going to get all this money back. Uh, uh, if we invest $7 million, we're getting over $7 million back. Every single state is offering incentives. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, the state of Kansas is offering incentives uh, that uh, one of the commissioners want to uh, include in this, uh, I understand that. that that's part of, of what we're trying to do to entice people uh, and businesses like Spirit Aerosystems to uh, be here in this area. The impact is amazing. $2.7 billion of new payroll money infused into our economy, direct jobs, 1,000, average base wage, 56,000, indirect jobs, spinoff, 1,270. These are suppliers, home builders, accounting, and so forth. Construction jobs in the short term, 1,550. 
slide has it up here in bold. $2.7 billion in new payroll and earnings infused into our community over the next 20 years. We are building a building. We have clawback position uh, in, in inserted in the agreement. Uh, Spirit's doing what no other company before them has done. Their investment in expanding these product lines and in our community ensures jobs for this generation and the next generation and beyond. The people that are going to be working at Spirit, high paying jobs, are going to be building houses. They're going to be buying cars, buying big screen TVs. They're going to be going to our colleges and universities. They're putting our, their, their children in our schools. The impact is felt across this entire region, not just in Sedgwick County. I am proud to be part of this. I am proud to support this. I am very happy that Spirit Aerosystems has chosen Sedgwick County uh, to remain and to grow. Uh, for therefore, I'm going to support this uh, motion. Uh, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? No. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Or excuse me, Commissioner Unruh? Aye. And Chairman Dennis? Aye. Again, thank you to Spirit uh, for being here. Thank you for GWP. Uh, thanks to the City of Wichita, our legal team that worked on all of this, uh, and the rest of our staff. Thanks very much. Madam Clerk, next item. Item G, consideration of a grant in the amount of $3,051,441.16 for the Kansas Department of Corrections Juvenile Services, State Fiscal Year 19, funding and approving to enter into contract with Kansas Legal Services for Prevention Services. Glenda, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Good morning, Commissioners. Glenda Martins, Division uh, Corrections Director. This morning, I'm here to present for your approval the State Fiscal Year 19 Juvenile Grant Application to the Kansas Department of Corrections Juvenile mm -hmm. Services Division. The grant funding provides juvenile justice programming to prevent and address delinquency. The Juvenile Corrections Advisory Board Team Justice approved the grant uh, application on March 2, 2019. The total planning uh, allocation for our district is $3,051,441. The planning allocation is continued flat funding from state fiscal year 18. The funding recommendation for prevention includes the Detention Advocacy Service program totaling $167,327. The Detention Advocacy Service Program provides attorney services to juveniles at detention hearings in case management alternative programming to facilitate release from detention pending further court action. The program is provided by Kansas Legal Services. The remainder of the funding application is for three state mandated graduated sanction programs. These programs are operated by the Division of Corrections, which include the Juvenile Intake and Assessment Center, our Juvenile Intensive Supervision Program, and our Juvenile Case Management. The recommendation, recommended funding allocation amount is $2,884,114. The state fiscal year grant application sustains current programming. There are no new FTEs being requested in this grant application, and there are no grant matches. I <clears throat> request your approval to submit, if awarded, the acceptance for the state fiscal year 19 grant application and authority to enter into contract with Kansas Legal Services. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do I have any questions? If not, Mr. Chairman, I'd move that we take the recommended action. Thank second. You. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Andrew? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioners. I'm here on the second grant award, and this is for community corrections to the Kansas <coughs> Department of Corrections for state fiscal year 19. Community corrections is a state mandated program within the adult correction system. Its purpose is to provide intensive supervision program based programming to rehabilitate felony offenders in the community as an alternative to prison. 
Community Corrections is, a state fund, is state funded through an annual grant process administered by the Kansas Department of Corrections. In order to continue to receive grant funds, an annual plan must be submitted on or before May 1st. The plan is before you today for approval. It reflects a continuation of existing programs. The programs are the Adult Intensive Supervision Program and the Adult Residential Facility. Within each program, staff members provide close supervision and services to assist offenders in gaining and maintaining employment, assessing treatment and training, drug testing, re and rehabilitation programming. AISP served 2,864 clients in state fiscal year 17 with an average daily population of approximately 1,500 clients. Community corrections agencies receive a planning allocation from the state to use in preparation for budgets for the next year's operation in state fiscal year 19. Sedgwick County planning allocation is $3,886,388. This represents a re reduction of approximately 141,000 from last year. As you know, the legisla legislature is still in session and the state budget has yet to be approved. Once that budget is approved, we will be notified of our actual award. We expect this part of the funding process to be completed by the end of June. The plan you have contains a great deal of data and information we use in managing all our adult programs. We continue to have a 96% supervision contact compliance rate since 2015. We have increased services through our high risk team and are serving a more intensive population. Sedgwick County is the largest corrections agency in the state of Kansas. The plan also contains strategies on how to reduce recidivism, focusing on the very high risk offenders, providing evidence-based programming with fidelity, work on employment, behavioral health programming, substance abuse, mental health issues, and we target these specific interventions. The Community Advi Corrections Advisory Board participated in the development of the plan and approved it on March 15. It is their recommendation, as well as mine, that you approve it. The grant award is due on or before May 1st to the Kansas Department of Corrections, and there are no grant match requirements. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I see no questions. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I will move that we take the recommended action. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner Donald? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Chair Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. And Glenda, you're back up. I'm back up. A final is um, it's a behavioral health grant application to the Kansas Department of Corrections for two state fiscal year 19. The purpose of this funding is to continue with the existing behavioral health programs within community corrections. The budget includes funding to sustain, sustain current positions that provide cognitive skills programming, peer mentoring, mental health strategies proven to, be, to reduce recidivism, and revocations. There are no new FTEs being requested in this grant application, and there are no match requirements. The grant application budget is for $627,263 and is due on or before May 1st to the Kansas Department of Corrections. There was a slight increase this year from last year by approximately 35,000. On March 15, the Community Corrections Advisory Board reviewed the application and recommends it for your approval as well as I do. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions. And for the record, all of us have been briefed on each one of these mm -hmm. items uh, ahead of time and, and reviewed them. So I want to make sure that everyone knows that uh, we uh, do read each of these and you do give us a complete briefing ahead of time. Yes, we do try to come around and talk with each of you about what we're doing in corrections and how we're working with our clients. Thank you. Commissioner Unruh? Mr. Chairman, I'd move that we take the recommended action. Thank second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? 
Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranzo? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. Mr. Yost, uh, we have an off agenda item. It's uh, up to Thank you. Thank you, at this Commissioners. Point. Yes, we do. <laughs> but I can't make the motion. One of you has to. But uh, first of all, we do need to have a motion for an off agenda item. I move yes. that uh, we uh, add an off agenda item to our agenda at this point, and we will discuss it in a moment. Mr. Chairman, I'd move that we consider an off agenda item at this time. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. Okay. Now, Mr. Yost, who is presenting this? Are we talking about the forensic uh, yes. uh, science uh, uh -huh. item? Shelley Stedman will introduce the item okay. on forensics. All right. Thank you. You bet. Good morning, Commissioners. I am Shelley Stedman. I am at the Regional Forensic Science Center, and I act in the capacity of the DNA Laboratory Manager. I am here today in place of Dr. Tim Roig, who you're probably more familiar with, in introduction of these items. I want to qualify my presentation this morning by pointing out that our grant deadline was May 7th, and I prepared this item and submitted it to Mr. Hughes last week um, with the anticipation of presenting this at the May 2nd meeting but have since learned that that meeting may not happen. And so this was the only way that we could bring this information before you in order to still meet the federal grant deadline. Uh, I understand you may not have had a lot of time to review it and, and that there may be questions. As a matter of background, this is a capacity enhancement and backlog reduction program that is administered primarily by the National Institute of Justice. I have been involved with participation in this grant for a number of years now and it is aimed at assisting DNA laboratories in increasing capacity. The project goals include increasing laboratory throughput, reducing backlog, and reducing the number of samples waiting tested. That said, I feel like the project is directly in line with the county's mission and our mission at the Regional Forensic Science Center. To give you some background, in 2016, we were successful in acquiring some new instrumentation through this grant. And while our backlog has continued to increase, towards the end of last year, once that uh, instrumentation became validated and went on the line, the uh, backlog re was reduced from 144 days to approximately 80. So it does take time once these instruments are purchased and validated to see the increased throughput, but I just wanted to give you an example of how this has had a very positive impact in Sedgwick County in the past. This is a formula grant, and the state of Kansas is eligible this year for $709,000. That is an amount in excess of what was available to the state last year, and that's because our population is not growing as fast as our crime rate. As an example, in the state of Kansas, homicides and rapes have increased by 24 and 22 percent respectively over the 10-year average. And if you look at a local snapshot, which is important because the Wichita Police Department is the primary requester for DNA services, the DNA, the lab, the, sorry, the crime rate for violent crimes at the Wichita Police Department has increased 35% between the years 2014 and 2017. That said, some of you may also be aware that in 2014, the state of Kansas convened a statewide multidisciplinary task force, and they set out to assess the number of untested kits that exist in the state of Kansas. And of over 2,200 <coughs> untested kits, more than half of them reside in Sedgwick County. I have served on that multidisciplinary task force, and just last week, the director of the KBI issued a letter to all law enforcement across the state and provided the recommendation that 100% of sexual assault kits that are collected be tested. To give you an example of what impact that will have on Sedgwick County, we currently receive 30% of the rape kits that are collected in the county for testing, and so we expect that our submissions will triple. 
In determining how we could best use our portion of this money, I focused on what we could do to increase the processing of the rape kits. And to that end, I've requested in this grant period a total of $245,000. The greater portion of that will go towards the purchase of some newer automated technology that will allow us to differentially extract mixed stains and quantify male DNA that's present. That will replace other classical serological techniques whereby we sit at the microscope and scan slides for sperm cells. So we think that we can increase the throughput from weeks to a period of days. Not to mention that this is the gold standard for technology today and it's far more sensitive, which may be able, may allow us the ability to detect male DNA in forensic samples where sperm cells went undetected. That said, acquiring these workstations and platforms requires that they be validated. We can't just plug these into the wall and start doing casework. We have to prove through tests of accuracy, precision, linearity, that they work and that they will hold up in court. To that end, I have several options. I can take one of my fully qualified DNA analysts that we've invested over two years to train and remove them from casework and assign them the task of the validation. Or I can, I can purchase validation services from a variety of vendors who would come into the lab, conduct the studies, compile the data, and write the reports. Initially, I thought that was our best option, but considering the number of instruments that we need, that would cost at approximately $160,000. So I decided to take the approach that has been used by other laboratories in the state and ask for a technician for a period of a year while these grant funds are available to conduct that validation at a far lesser cost, just below $60,000. The final thing that is a component of this grant, quite simply, is the, the chemistry, the reagents, and the chemicals that we need to conduct that validation. And you have before you the financial considerations. And if you um, have any additional questions about the project, or my proposal, I would be delighted to answer those. Well, first of all, thank you for your flexibility in being here today. I, I know that this is planned to have on an agenda later, uh, but uh, the commissioners will all be at a meeting for the Kansas uh, County Commissioners uh, Association on the date that we were originally going to schedule this. So thank you very much for your flexibility. Uh, I do believe that uh, the grant that uh, you're looking at uh, would be very worthwhile for our Forensic Science Center. Uh, I, I would make a motion that uh, we take the necessary action to approve the grant. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Commissioner Unruh, comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to make note that uh, in your backup material, it indicates that the laboratory is on the brink of a caseload capacity crisis. And I think if we can have avoid a crisis by using uh, grant resources that's um, good good management on our part so thank you for bringing this to our attention and I'm willing to support the um, motion thank you Commissioner Howell thank you Mr. Chairman I was probably going to make a motion or a second but I appreciate uh, those those of you that did that I want to say I appreciate the <coughs> presentation I think you guys do great work I'm glad we have some assistance to help us get uh, guess caught back up and uh, provide uh, maybe a more timely service this obviously going to be needed but I also wanted to point out I'm sure that you don't want me to recognize you this way but I do want to make it clear to my colleagues that just want to make sure that you all know that this is also Mayor Stedman from the city of Mulvane uh, that's presenting this morning so she's not just a doctor at our forensic science uh, organization but and a Citric County employee that we appreciate very much but she's also serving uh, the city of Mulvane as a city mayor so I wanted you to know that and so uh, glad to support the motion this morning thank you Mr. Chairman thank you Commissioner Unruh. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think you will recall, as I do, that um, the mayor was over stuffing pillows for the aging department the other day, so she's a, a versatile person. We thank you for your support of the aging department. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ranzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this, part of this is a one FTE, one position. Will it only be for a year? Yes, the grant is, uh, is a static amount, and so unless I would be able to renew that position through this same grant, that would only be for a year. 
And so what happens to that employee? That employee would be hired with the understanding that it's a grant funded position in the same manner that the other laboratories hire theirs. Okay. Um, is this something you think we need long term or no? Well, through the routine budget process, which I have some involvement with, we have uh, continued to request an FTE or, or more than one FTE in the DNA laboratory and, and are continuing with that request this year. So I do believe it is needed. Okay, so we've asked for this before. And in the budget process, as I, it's, we've had to say no. That. My understanding is there's some, some debate out in the community whether or not you really need to do 100% or not for law enforcement reasons. I, I don't know all the details about that, but but this is exactly what I was talking about a little while ago. We have to make tough decisions and budgets every year. This request has come up before, and we've said no, we can't spend county taxpayer dollars to do this. But we can afford to spend $790,000 a year to give the spirit to build a building. That's where we're at. So now we're going to take money from the federal government that's printing money and has trillion dollars of debt so, and put it upon our children to do something that we ought to pay for ourselves. Or we have a debate, yes or no. I mean, we have to make tough decisions. We can't fund everything. But we can fund things, $200,000 for DOC and a bunch of other stuff that the local oligarchs want, but we can't fund this. This is a problem. Notwithstanding the debate whether or not you should do 100% do or not or whatever, but this is exactly what I'm talking about. We just voted $790,000 a year, and that project was happening anyway, despite what we, you know, elected officials like to say. And now we're faced here doing this. This is problematic, because in the past, I've supported um, federal funds for equipment have avoided doing these one-offs as far as staff because, you know, we shouldn't have staff and then let them go. Um, if it's important, then we need to pay for it. This is very problematic and um, clearly demonstrates some of the choices that we make and, and why I try to fight on behalf of the taxpayer for some of the spending that, uh, um, that we do to, that I think harms our ability to do things like this. That. But it's okay because we can always shove it off on the federal government, borrow some money, and make our kids pay for it with interest later on, and pound our chests and make it seem like we do everything for everybody and there's no cost to it. So, this is not, I mean, this is not good government when you put it all together. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Antel. I uh, want to echo the comments. Not only the mayor of uh, Mulvane uh, helped us uh, stuff uh, pillows last week at Aging, but also was at the Pando Initiative uh, fundraising event last week uh, to help uh, uh, help our schools. So we appreciate everything you do for our community. See no further discussion. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Ranza. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner Unruh. Aye. Chairman Dennis. Aye. Um, one other thing, we had discussed uh, the possibility of having a second off agenda item, uh, and the uh, second off agenda item was going to, to relate to uh, a, a project that we passed uh, last week. Uh, I, I'll let Commissioner O'Donnell explain what's yeah. going on with that, and then I'll give a further explanation of uh, our decision not to have an off agenda item today. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last week, and I know our counselor's out of the room, but I talked to him about it yesterday, but we passed the Delano Neighborhood Plan. Um, it was brought by city staff to the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, Dale Miller, brought it forward, and then yesterday the Wichita City Council uh, decided they want to make changes to it, so they're going to be bringing that back in June. Um, I guess what probably concerns me most, Mr. Chairman, is that if it's a city-led initiative, they should pass it first before it then comes back to MAPC to get reverted to us. Um, so it was completely out of step of normal policy. And as an advocate and supporter and representative of the Delano neighborhood, 
I, I expect, um, you know, a, a little bit of common sense when it comes to uh, pushing forward um, something as important as a Delano neighborhood plan and wires got crossed and unfortunately the city has decided to defer that until June to get more community input. Um, so I was going to make a suggestion that we reconsider our motion from last week, but um, as you requested, I'll uh, not make that motion today. Thank you. And let me explain that uh, in a little bit. Well, first, Commissioner Renz, do you have some comments? No, I guess I need to hear Okay. Uh, let me explain it a little bit more. Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, I did learn that uh, the city of Wichita had not passed it. They deferred it until uh, late in June. And then uh, Commissioner uh, O'Donnell and uh, uh, Mr. Yost and I uh, spoke about it uh, a, a little bit on whether or not we should reconsider the, mo the motion that we had uh, a week ago. So I spoke with the mayor last night about it, uh, and uh, they did send it, uh, or they did defer it. Uh, it looks like that there is some concern about uh, the way that the, the plan was uh, drawn up. It is part of our comprehensive plan, and that's why we vote on it. Even though it's entirely within uh, the city of Wichita and the Delano district, uh, the comprehensive plan is a joint Sedgwick County uh, Wichita plan. So anything that goes into that plan needs to be approved by both organizations. Uh, oh, we didn't have any input uh, to it, honestly, uh, other than saying, yes, uh, this is something that uh, the city of Wichita is interested in, and so therefore uh, we approved it. The problem came about in the fact that uh, planning department, for some reason, and I've talked to the manager about it uh, this morning, uh, brought it to us before it went to the city of Wichita, and that's completely backwards of the way that it should have happened. It should have gone to the city of Wichita because it's really their part of it, and then come to Sedgwick County. Uh, so we're not going to do that in the future. Uh, if it's uh, strictly Wichita, it's going to go to Wichita first, and then uh, it will come to us. Or, or if vice versa, if it's strictly Sedgwick County, it'll come to us and then go to Wichita. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is I, I don't believe that we need to, to rescind that or do anything with the uh, motion we had last week because if changes are made, the, the comprehensive plan is a living document, and I made that comment last week. Uh, and so it's designed for changes to be made to it. Uh, that, that way it doesn't get old, you set it on a shelf, and it's not a, a plan that can be used for the future. Uh, so since they deferred it, uh, I'd say that there's probably a strong possibility that changes are going to be made, and therefore the vote that we had uh, uh, last week is probably a moot point anyway, because uh, it is a living document, and we're going to have to go through and uh, review the new document before we vote on it again. So. Uh, therefore, I, I don't know that we really need to change it uh, because it's not an official part of the comprehensive plan at this point uh, unless it goes to the city of Wichita and, and they approve it. And at that point, if we find that there are some problems with it, we could always change uh, what our position is on it. So I think we need to let Wichita work it out. It's their uh, issue right now. And uh, once Wichita works it out, then it can come back to us and we can uh, decide whether or not that we do need to make any changes. So. Uh, that's the reason that I don't think that we need to reconsider it today. Commissioner Ranzow? Well, I, uh, I voted against that uh, item last week because I thought it was premature. Um, you know, people need to understand that this is sort of, was one of those things that come before us that we're, we just expected to rubber stamp. Uh, I'm hearing behind the scenes the reason is, is getting hung up because we got developers calling elect officials saying why did you vote for that because some people don't 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 like it don't necessarily want to do it and so you really have it's really not about the necessarily the merits of the thing it's local developers calling you know pairing up into their groups and one so one group wants one group doesn't want it and says hey why are you vote for this stuff um, and that's problematic, but it's indicative of what goes on here in local politics to a degree that people just don't understand. And um, too many issues that come before us that we vote on, uh, we vote that way because it's expected, not necessarily because of the merits. And this is just another example, in my estimation. Thank you. Hey, next item, please. 
Item J, report of the Board of Bids and Contracts, regular meeting of April 12th, 2018. Joe, welcome. Welcome. Good to be here. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. For the record, Joe Thomas, Purchasing Director. Uh, we have eight items recommended that resulted from the meeting of the Board of Bids and Contracts of April 12th that we're seeking your approval for. Item number one is the road improvements, which involves the 2018 painted pavement marking project for Public Works. And this recommendation is to accept the low bid from Traffic Control Services Incorporated in the amount of $463,725.50. Item number two is the laboratory services for various departments. This recommendation is to accept the proposal from Affiliated Medical Services Laboratory for the pricing, pricing listed and establish contract pricing for three years with two one-year options to renew. Item number three, livery services for the Regional Forensic Science Center. Recommendation is to accept the proposal from Preferred Mortuary Services at the, the rate listed for a two-year period with three one-year options to renew. Item number four is EMS Post 8 Remodel and Building Repairs for Project Services. The recommendation is to accept the low bid, including alternate number one from Compton Construction Services, LLC, in the amount of $356,900. Item number five is the construction of a new EMS Post 15 for project services. This recommendation is to accept the low bid from Multicon Incorporated in the amount of $799,000. Item number six is a 2018 Dodge Charger Police Package Vehicles for Fleet Management. And the recommendation is to accept the low bid from Davis Moore Automotive in the amount of $80,790. Item number seven is the 2018 Ford Police Interceptor Utility Marked Vehicles for Fleet Management. And this recommendation is to accept the low bid from Rusty Eck Ford incorporated in the amount of $99,549. And our final recommendation, item eight, is the mid-size tracked excavator with a wood shredder option for fleet management. The recommendation is to accept the proposal from Murphy Tractor and Equipment Company in the amount of $198,995. I'll try to answer any questions you may have, and I recommend approval of these eight items. Thank you. Commissioner Howell. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I won't be making a motion, but I will be uh, supportive of uh, um, colleagues who probably want to make a motion with, with respect to the EMS stations. I just want to make a couple of uh, comments and have a couple of quick questions. Uh, number number one, I'm just curious on the uh, on the road restriping on item number one. The uh, we also do crack seal on all of the roads every year. Is that correct? I just want to confirm that. David Spears, assistant county manager. We we don't do crack seal on all the roads uh, every year, but of a significant portion of them okay so it's not connected to the striping though. I understand okay good um, I'd like to know more about the, the the crack seal but we can we can talk about that later I was just curious about that uh, item number two uh, I'm curious about how that was analyzed uh, you know it depends on how many of those services are provided uh, the, the number so the dollar figure for each one of those services is drastically different um, the three different vendors uh, there, each one of them has low cost on certain types of pr services and so I guess the way I would have analyzed that would be to see how many services we actually need of each one of those items and then kind of do an extended cost and then a total cost but I don't see that in front of me so I'm curious if that was done I believe it was sir and, uh, and what we can do is get the information to you uh, with the I, I, I was thinking that they took the annual usage for the previous year and were able to determine a low overall yeah, that would be that would be good to know that. Again, I, I support the bid board process, and I'm I'm, I'm sure if that if that analysis is done, that's probably something I'd be glad to support. I just wanted to ask the question because the data is not on the on the material there. And I, number three, I'm just curious if we transport uh, for uh, forensics uh, science center, if, that, if that's a billable service, do we do we pr um, recover any of that money that's used to transport? I think Ms. Stedman just left. I am not sure whether we recover any of those. Oh, you can you can answer that question later as well. It's just more okay. of a curiosity, and that's uh, on on the next two items. I just want to say I'm really proud of the county for finding uh, more efficient ways to do this. We're we're going to um, essentially have uh, refurbished EMS station up north and and another one, uh, brand new one northeast. I'm really proud of the 
the county for doing those two things. I'm glad to support this uh, today, assuming there's a motion made to do so. Um, I'm very pleased to see that on our list of things to do today. And, um, and then finally, I'm curious about items uh, six and seven. Why are, we, why, are we, why are we doing two different kinds of vehicles? It seems like they're very much similar. I guess I'm trying to find out why would we do three of one and three of the other. Item number six is significantly cheaper than item seven. Uh, Penny Poland, Fleet Management. The sheriff has a mixed fleet of Dodge Chargers and Ford Interceptors. I guess, I guess I'm wondering, why, they're, but they're used, they're used identically in the field. I'm curious why we, why we need two different kinds of vehicles. Some of the vehicles are used uh, to go off-road if needed. Okay. All right. Well, okay, let me think about that one for a minute. But, and then finally, I, I remember eight. I want to say I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we finally have uh, this equipment on our list of things to purchase. It's been long overdue. We, uh, we tried to increase our extreme maintenance capabilities a while back, and uh, this, is de this is definitely necessary. I did notice that they we're selecting the non-lowest bid on this one, but I'm curious as to why that would be. There were, I believe, a couple reasons, uh, Commissioner. The uh, size of the uh, cubic displacement of the engine, both of these engines were turbocharged, but as you'll notice, one had uh, a little more cubic inch displacement giving it a little more power and when this piece of equipment is in the stream bed or when it's picking up a, a log or concrete there are times when they need that extra power horsepower in order to uh, accomplish what they need so this this is why you notice this was a proposal because uh, it was not just going to be strictly the price but there was consideration for that also consideration for what was known as the relief and boost pressure the boost pressure is almost like a kicks in a little extra power for it to adjust to whatever situation they meet in those stream beds okay good and that last picture there is that that's the uh, tree trimmer attachment this has tree shredder <laughs> tree shredder yes that's correct yeah that looks pretty exciting uh, i'd like to see that working someday we need a video of that we need a video of that anyway I, i'm pleased uh, overall with the uh, report today but i will let someone else make the motion thank you mr chairman Thank you. Commissioner Ranzo. Yeah, well, I, uh, a couple of things. I was just going to say on, you know, item number eight, it, I still continue to have concerns with our specifications that sometimes I think we do this to get at a certain, uh, arrive at a certain decision. But I want to talk primarily about uh, items four and five of the EMS uh, Buildings. One of them is the repair in Meyer uh, district, and the other one is the new one in Commissioner Andrews. This is stuff that we've been working on for a long time, and I think originally when these came up, they were proposed to be built. Both of them are going to be new buildings for 1.4 to 1.6 or something, maybe even more. It's around $3 million. Now we're going to get these two done for less than $1.2 million. So we're saving considerable amounts of money, probably doubling the number of. Uh, facilities we can get compared to what we used to. I know in the past, I remember an EMS station has a vehicle and a couple people in it, there's no sleeping quarters, but you have a little place to, to sit. And we were spending 1.4, 1.5 million dollars on each facility and $800,000 for a new one is still a lot of money, but it's significantly, I mean, a bit close to cutting it in half. And so I think this is a good move and moving forward that'll help us get a, a much, much better bang for our buck. and. And I appreciate uh, staff and commissioners. Like I say, this is something we've been trying to get done for a few years now, and we're finally getting there, and I appreciate that. So I'll be supportive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Enroe. Well, I'd like to second Commissioner Ranzaw's comments, first of all, and then secondly, make a motion that we approve the recommendations of the Board of Bids and Contracts. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Next item, please. <clears throat> consent agenda. Commissioners, uh, Mike Scholes, County Manager, recommend you approve consent agenda items Kilo through Victor. Move that we approve items Kilo through mm -hmm. Victor on the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call roll. <clears throat> Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Andrew? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to recess the 
uh, Board of County Commissioners meeting mm -hmm. and call to order the uh, governing body of Fire District Number 1 for April 18th, 2018. Madam Clerk, first item. Roll call. Commissioner O'Donnell? Present. Commissioner Ranza? Present. Commissioner Howe? Present. Commissioner Henry? Present. Chairman Dennis? Present. Next item, please. Public agenda. Does anyone in the audience uh, wish to speak on the public agenda for the Board of Fire? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the next item. Consent agenda. Commissioners, Mike Scholes again. County Manager, recommend you approve consent agenda item alpha. Thank you. Move to approve consent agenda item alpha. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Henry? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. This time I'd like to adjourn the Board of Fire and reconvene the uh, board, Sedgwick County Board of County Commissioners. Uh, next item, please. Legislative issues. Will, how are you doing? I'm good, Commissioners. Uh, Will Deere, Assistant County Counselor. Uh, legislature is adjourned right now, so we don't really have a lot to report. Um, both of our bills that I mentioned, the Election Commissioner Budget Bill and the Urban Area Designation Bill, to my knowledge, haven't been signed by the Governor, but they're in transit. I don't know if Mr. Yost has heard something different. But okay. We have questions about the legislative agenda. Seeing none, thank you. <clears throat> Next item. Other. Does anyone have anything for other? Well, I'd like to say a couple comments. Uh, I don't see anything else. Uh, earlier this week, uh, I was able to go to the uh, USD 259 Good Apple Award, and uh, I was pleased that they recognized a member of the CDDO, uh, Peter Daniels. He was recognized by Dunlap Transition Campus at Chisholm, and the description read, Peter supports our community at SCC SCDDO by providing hub services to those with disabilities. He directs the business leadership, BLN support, supporting those with disabilities in our community to connect with the employers and jobs and also improves the community as a small business owner appreciated. Uh, I want to make sure that I pass on uh, the entire Board of County Commissioner's appreciation uh, for all that he does for, for uh, not only our citizens but the students uh, and I want to thank him. And uh, just on a side note, the reason I was there was because uh, my son, who teaches at Northwest High School, was also receiving a good apple that night. So uh, I was there for a couple reasons. But congratulations on Peter. Anything else for other? Seeing nothing, Madam Clerk, next item. Executive session. Thank you. We do have an executive session. Uh, <coughs> uh, Commissioner Unruh. Mr. Chairman, um, I have two motions to uh, make here. The first is uh, both related to executive session. The first is I move that the Board of County Commissioners recess into executive session for 15 minutes until 1135 to consult with an attorney for, the, for this commission, which would be de deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship. The executive session is required to protect attorney-client privilege and the public interest. We have a second. motion, and I will second that. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, don't call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. And Commissioner Unruh, next uh, item. I move that the Board of County Commissioners recess into executive session for 30 minutes until 12.05 to discuss personnel matters of non-elected personnel. The executive session is required to protect the privacy interests of an identifiable individual and that the Board of County Commissioners return to this room from executive session no sooner than 12.05. We have a motion. I will second that. Discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Ranza? Aye. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Commissioner Andrew? Aye. Chairman Dennis? Aye. With that, we are uh, in recess. And I'm going to the back conference. And we're going to the back conference. Right? Thank you. <laughs>